Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Heidi ho mammals! So, Patrick and I, hi, we're trying to come up with a new collab topic after making that Lego Star Wars video last year. And then we thought, why not just do more Star Wars? I f***ing love Star Wars! You know, most of the time. A actually, not even even most, just, just some of the time. So the question remains, was there another Star Wars subsidiary in our childhood that was beloved by many? It's far from a hot take to say that the prequels failed to live up to their own story, at least for most people. Memeable, they may be, but good feature films, they are not. And that's a darn shame when considering how heartbreaking the synopsis of Anakin's turn to the dark side is. A slave turned war hero turned political pawn against their surrogate family due to the resentment built up thanks to the death of their original family is a compelling story brought to life with some of the most sterile and stilted acting, directing, and dialogue ever. That's what happens when you try to do everything yourself, George. If only we had a team of talented Star Wars fans who could reinterpret and develop the story of Anakin's gradual fall to the dark side over a longer span than just three loosely connected movies. Ha! What are you talking about, idiot? That already exists! It's called the Clone Wars! Clone Wars is the best wars to ever happen in the star. The Clone Wars TV show is the reason the prequel era is my favorite in all of Star Wars. Through simple tweaks to the characters and story, this show managed to turn some cripplingly flawed movies into the basis for some of the best stories ever told in Star Wars. Patrick and I grew up loving this show as kids, and it only got better as it went along, peaking in its later seasons rather than its earlier ones. How rare is that for a show? It's for this reason that we thought it'd be cool to do an entire retrospective of all seven seasons, seeing how some of the earlier ones hold up, and having an excuse to gush about the later ones. This seemed to be a good idea until James reminds me that we had to rewatch the movie. Oh god damn it! <sighs> I got a bad feeling about this. Y you get it? That that that's the Star Wars thing, L -l -l like in the movies. Keep this up, and the only thing we're gonna get is our money back. <laughs> no need to be hurtful. Okay, so quick abridged history. Shortly after Revenge of the Sith came out, George Lucas was like, "Uh, we better make a uh, uh animated uh TV show about the uh Clone Wars era. Uh, you know, it's stylistically designed to be animated, and we can't undo that, but we can diminish the effects of." <laughs> It seemed to be going well. Lucas hired some guy named Dave Filoni, who directed multiple episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender. He was a big Star Wars fan, and especially a massive fan of Plo Koon. You know, Plo Koon. That guy. He got died in Revenge of the Sick movie. The final fun fact about Dave Filoni is that his cowboy hat is the source of his power, and that's why he never takes it off. You see this shot of him playing this X-Wing pilot in The Mandalorian? I have it on good authority that he was wearing his cowboy hat underneath the helmet. You have to trust me guys, I have insider info. My uncle is Disney, so there. So Dave Filoni, George Lucas, and the rest of the team whose names I do not know were developing the show and it was coming together well. Then one day, George Lucas took a look at the nearly completed first few episodes of the series and said, uh, why don't we take these episodes and uh, put them in theaters as a big movie. And the team was like, oh. They didn't sign up for a movie. They thought this was gonna be just for TV. This isn't cinema quality animation, but George just couldn't help going too far in a few places as usual. And thus, Star the Clone Wars Wars was born. <laughs> if you thought the prequels got bad reception, Holy shit, dude. Critics tore this movie apart. And like, did it deserve to be ripped to shreds? <laughs> Yes, definitely, absolutely, it's a really bad movie. But to the extent critics went, eh, I don't know about that. It's only the fourth worst Star Wars movie after all. But it's also abundantly clear that this was never made for the big screen. And it's one of the last examples of George Lucas having too much control over Star Wars during this era, with no one being able to keep him in check. The thing is though, whether you're looking at this story as a movie or as a four episode arc of a TV show, either way, 
it's still really bad. It's not a good introduction to these characters, and it's clear that Filoni and his team hadn't quite found their footing yet. So, before we get into the mostly excellent TV show, we dive into this unflattering introduction of what these here Clone Wars are about. Let's-a go! <laughs> The animation in this movie is poodoo. The Clone Wars has a very distinct style, what with its angular caricatures of Star Wars characters. It really looks like they took Gendy's Clone Wars and made it 3D. A unique animation style which may look off-putting at first, but it's really grown on people over time. Nah, the reason that animation is poodoo isn't because of any art style, it's because the animation is wildly unfinished. Nothing in this movie looks cinematic. The facial expressions are stiff, the lighting is flat, the backgrounds are sterile. Look at this shot of Captain Rex. Look at it! This was in theaters. This was considered okay for the big screen. I'm, I'm gonna do it. None of you can stop me. I think the biggest embarrassment in the animation department are the lightsaber duels. They are just so stilted and so awkward that even as a kid I felt underwhelmed by them. Every hit just feels like two action figures being smashed together. They cut between poses so quickly that it doesn't feel like fluid movement at all. But at least Obi-Wan gets to do his epic wall jump maneuver. The show's duels, on the other hand, are filled with so much kinetic energy, it's clear that these episodes were not only put into theaters for no good reason, but the episodes were also clearly rushed out. The animation is nowhere near the level of polish present in the actual show. Despite all of this, the animation is still somehow better than Rebels. Now we must leave before more Rebels stands arrive. Hey, all this talk of Rebels reminds me. Let's talk about how bad the story is in this movie. <laughs> I can't believe how dumb this movie's plot is. It's about rescuing Jabba the Hutt's son. Let me run that by you again. Anakin and Ahsoka have to rescue the son of Jabba the Hutt. Who, who, who even thought of that? That's literally the dumbest plot I could think of. It sounds like a parody. Look at this stupid baby hut. I hate huts. <laughs> If this was intended to be a movie from the start, I guess I can say that this was a pathetic attempt to appeal to little kids in the audience. But it was just meant to be part of the show, which makes its existence as a plotline even stupider. Okay, let's rewind a bit. The Separatists kidnapped Jabba's son. In response, Jabba asked the Republic to get him back. The Republic agrees because if they help Jabba, he will give them access to his private... space... trade... lanes. Basically, this entire movie is the Republic and the Separatists fighting over who gets to use the easy pass lane. At the end of the movie, Dooku bemoans the fact that the Separatists will have to drive in regular traffic, making their fight much more difficult. Even though A, these space lanes are never brought up once in the entirety of the Clone Wars series, and B, Palpatine controls both sides of the war, so this would have been a victory for him either way, and Dooku knows this. Why are you so glum? Your plan for galactic conquest is going perfectly. This this so-called failure is pointless. Nothing in this movie matters. This is all a huge waste of time, made worse by the fact that they tried to humanize Jabba the f***ing Hutt. We're supposed to sympathize with this grotesque, womanizing, frog-eating mafia boss because he lost his son. Well, golly gee, I sure am glad to see him get a happy ending. Let's just ignore the fact that Anakin saves the life of Jabba's son only for Jabba to later enslave and try to execute Anakin's children. Gee, what a good guy. And what the f*** happened to Bib Fortuna? I know he works for Jabba during the prequels, I saw him. And what happened to Mrs. The Hutt? He doesn't like to talk about it. Oh, but don't worry, the hut quota in this movie is filled by the greatest and most necessary Star Wars character ever. Zero the Hut, Jabba's sassy gay uncle who speaks English and lives on Coruscant. It's hysterical. <laughs> In the final 22 minutes of this movie, they introduce Padme, who informs us that Jabba has an uncle on Corazon who we have never heard of until now. Padme goes to Zero, hoping to get the Republic back on good terms with the Hutt clan, because at this point in the movie, Dooku has tricked Jabba into thinking that it is the Jedi who are the kidnappers of Jabba's son, thanks to Anakin just having to be racist. I hate Hutts. <laughs> But then Padme overhears Zero and Dooku explain their evil plan in excruciating detail. It's really an amazing twist, considering we've only known Zero as a character for five minutes. Hey James, 
What? I, I guess this makes Zero a twist villain! Oh! This whole Zero subplot is the best example of how this just structurally does not work as a movie. It would be fine to introduce Zero in his own episode, but in the last 20 minutes of a feature film? Why? Honestly, everything HUD related just drags this movie down. Jabba is misused, Zero is dumb, and the baby HUD annoys me with all the stinky jokes that surround it. I don't understand understand how the idea of making a baby Java came before making a baby Yoda. Who looked at this horrifying monster and said, uh, yeah, we can cutify that. You know, it's stylistically designed to be cute and we, we can we can do that and we can diminish the effects of its not cuteness. It's so dense. Every single frame has something cute going on. Also, this is an incredibly pedantic nitpick, but I love the scene where Ahsoka says the baby hut is burning up, and Anakin feels how warm he is using his robot hands. Like, yeah, I'm sure that gave you a good sense of his temperature. Let's see. Is there anything else to talk about? Uh, Ventress is here. They just lifted her from the Clone Wars cartoon without explaining who she is. One would think they could really showcase the contrast between Anakin and Ahsoka's relationship and Dooku and Ventress's. But they don't do anything with that. Ventress is just a generic mini-boss, except not even for Anakin and Ahsoka. Obi-Wan fights her after they already left the planet with this punky poodoo producer, meaning this fight is pointless. And now for the epic finale on Tatooine, the only planet where important galactic events ever seem to happen. There's so much more we can talk about out here. Like the sand. Oh! oh boy, Anakin's on his home planet for the first time since his mommy died. I wonder if that'll lead to any emotional scenes. I don't want to talk about it. Nope, none. We can't have him open up to Ahsoka or be emotionally vulnerable for a change. That would provide good character growth and render this movie not pointless. Instead, they wander the desert for a bit and split up in order to trick Count Dudu. Dooku, being the megalomaniacal maniac he is, uses a sand attack on Anakin and manages to kill Jabba's son. I have just killed Jabba's son. <laughs> you fool! I have 70 alternative accounts! <laughs> Oh, I've been tricked. Oh, man, you tricked me. You got me good. <laughs> I got you, man. Anakin jacks Dooku's ride in order to help Ahsoka, and Dooku just laughs it off. What are you laughing at, Dooku? You gotta walk home in the sand now. Do you know how coarse, rough, and irritating that shit is? Anyway, Ant-Man and Asoda get Baby back to the daddy, and he tries to kill them. But at that exact moment, Padme calls and gets Zero to confess that it was him all along. Happy ending! Yoda's here! Good relations with the Hutties he has. Okay, so that may be the worst plot of any Star Wars movie. Somehow Palpatine returns. Never mind. But hey, the characters are probably good, right? Anakin is a huge improvement over his prequel persona, and this movie introduces Ahsoka. Everyone loves Ahsoka, right? Oh wait, hold that thought. I'm getting an urgent transmission from Zero the Hut. Oh hi, it's me, Zero the Hut. I'm just really bored in prison. I wish I could do something fun like make a website for my Hut Empire business and stuff. Wow, Zero the Hut from Star of the Clone Wars Wars. Didn't you know that you can make a website? Really? How can I do that? Using Squarespace. Squarespace is a fantastic, intuitive, online website builder that allows you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs. Display projects in customizable galleries and add password-protected pages to share private work with clients. You can even present your videos from YouTube, Vimeo, and Animoto on your Squarespace site. Add an image overlay to your video to improve your website's load speed by waiting to embed video players until playback starts. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile experience that matches the overall style of your website. So your content will look great on every device, every time. And if you don't want that, you can always disable the mobile view from Website Manager. Buying a domain from Squarespace is simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page and free WHOIS privacy on eligible domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose a URL that ends in .com, .net, 
.org, or if you're feeling funky, you can get a more specific one like .art. If you're ready to share your passions or promote your business with the rest of the world, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash shapefearless to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Wow, thanks. I'm going to make a website now and use it to hire bounty hunters to break me out of prison. That sounds good and definitely 100% compliant with the canon of the series. Bye-bye. Okay, so what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, Ahsoka sucks in this movie. Okay, so this is going to be a really hard pill for you guys to swallow, but it needs to be said. Ahsoka is really annoying in this movie. She's actually kind of unbearable. On the one hand, it makes her growth throughout the show impressive because you can tangibly see how she becomes a more capable and mature character. But it doesn't improve her annoying, whiny, childish, arrogant persona in this movie. Now, as an eight-year-old with no grasp of quality, I didn't mind Ahsoka. I loved her, in fact, but I think that was only because I had a crush on her. I saw her as this badass teenage Jedi girl in a tube top. But in universe and to adults, she's more of your whiny younger sister who begs you to take her with you wherever you go, but complains every step of the way. Still, I have to ask, what was this character design about? She's 14 and in a war zone. I cannot stress enough how much every interaction she has with every character is irritating. We get to see her meeting Captain Rex, and at first it's pretty cool knowing how intertwined these two are later down in the saga. But then she's like, hey, if I'm a Jedi, don't I outrank you, Captain, who's been training for this war since birth while I literally just got here? Like, what am I supposed to take from that other than extreme smugness and arrogance? It's not like she improves that much over the course of the film. Like, there's a tiny arc where she realizes that being a Padawan is harder than she thought, but it's really nothing substantial. Speaking of nothing substantial, that's exactly how I'd describe Anakin and Ahsoka's relationship in this movie. I get what they're going for with Anakin having to adjust to training someone as brash and headstrong as he is, but all that really amounts to is constant bickering because Anakin is rightfully fed up with Ahsoka's blunders that are always the result of her arrogance. They try to balance this out with tender moments between the two, but I don't really buy that Anakin would feel this close to Ahsoka yet. Likewise, they definitely aren't close enough to the point where they would start cracking jokes with each other. If this were a TV show that didn't try to staple together the Battle of Crystalsis plot with the kidnapping plot, and those are just separate arcs in the show, then you could excuse the sudden and inexplicable bond between Anakin and Ahsoka. Because at least in a TV show, you wouldn't know how much time has passed between arcs. Anakin and Ahsoka could have bonded off screen because what we see on screen is really forced and unnatural. I feel like the script could have offered more instances where Ahsoka overestimates her abilities without seeming arrogant in the process. She could express an eagerness to fight the Separatists and save people while Anakin Anakin tries his best to gently let her know that this isn't how the war works. Emphasis on tries his best because this is Anakin we're talking about. There is an episode later on in season 1 where Ahsoka gets her troops killed and has to deal with the fallout of her mistake. But that's the kind of plotline they should have done early on, as in her first story arc. It would do wonders for Ahsoka's character arc and it would show how serious this war is. But no, we need to have her whine about how she needs to stand up behind enemy lines in this stupid box. Bro, it's so dumb that this worked at all. If I was playing Metal Gear and I hid in a cardboard box right in front of marching enemies, they would check what's in the mysterious box they just walked into. But I guess battle droids are really stupid, so okay. Yeah, Jedi cut them down like they're butter. And they really are pretty useless. And then, oopsie poopsie, they ran into a droidica. And then a super soaker complains instead of doing what her master says. Run! What? Jedi don't run! Master, destroy us! Hey, I figured out why Ahsoka is so terrible. She's just like Anakin. Ahsoka, a very wise Jedi. No, not so him. Now! No, Anakin, no! No! That's the one. While this movie takes great strides in making Anakin a better character than he was in the prequels, it then turns around and gives us the female reboot of prequel Anakin. Have fun, dicknips! Again, we must stress that Ahsoka develops into an amazing character over the course of the series. But we're not in the series, are we? No. 
Oh well, at least they didn't give up on her despite her shoddy introduction and poor initial reception. Unlike a certain other female character, am I right, Disney? But at the end of the day, this is still only the fourth worst Star Wars film for a reason. This movie is the spark that lit the fire that burns the prequel haters down. And as such, it's got some good stuff that set the foundation for an amazing show. Let's talk about that. First off, Anakin is really cool for the first time ever. He's my favorite main character in this series, and it's no different in this movie. Finally, he feels like a noble hero with a bit of a dark streak, which is what he should have been in the prequels themselves. Plus, Obi-Wan is his same old amazing self. I kind of wish this whole movie was just the two of them instead of having Ahsoka in it. Obi-Wan just hams up every scene he's in. The scene where he distracts Whore Loathsome by dragging out a surrender negotiation is actually pretty charming and fun. The whole Battle of Crystalsis is a pretty decent opener to the film outside of the annoying Ahsoka antics. The score is surprisingly really good. It's very unique and rather unconventional for Star Wars. I loved hearing it. It's cool that they got some of the original actors back for the movie, like Christopher Lee and Samuel L. Jackson. Less cool in Anthony Daniels' case since he literally has no life outside of voicing C-3PO. I like how this movie gives us a taste of how the show handles the clones. They're not just soulless killing machines, but they are still killed in droves because that's just how war is. I also love how Cody does karate on these droids. This guy, unfortunately, was not on his level. Also, also, the battle droids are pretty funny. You are a robot in a galaxy governed by the Force. Who is your god exactly? I like the one scene where Anakin quotes Qui-Gon when talking to Ahsoka. It felt wholesome and fitting. Uh, Rex says a bad word at some point. We've got an energy shield. That's gonna make things damn near impossible. That was pretty epic of him. I don't know, is there anything else to compliment? Well, you got me. By all accounts, we're dragging out the script. You know, I've just about had it with this movie. It's not good, but at least it's a starting point for the TV show that would go on to tell some of the best Star Wars stories ever. It's alright, a lot of great shows can't do pilots. Anyway, tune in next time for when we cover the actually good Star Wars product with the subtitle of Clone Wars. No, the other one. Yeah, boy! Until then, this has been Pappy G. Please check out my YouTube channel where I make a bunch of shit posts and AMVs and the like. And this has been Schaeferless Productions. May the force be- But seriously, check out my YouTube channel. According to statistics, 0% of viewers are subscribed-